So we do have some good news, and there's two different parts to that good news. Uh, the first good news is about the ancient pandemics of history. Smallpox, which we eradicated in 1980. Smallpox was the worst disease imaginable. In the last century, that was only 14 years ago, in the last century, smallpox killed half a billion people, more than all the wars in history. We're very close in polio. This month, we'll be celebrating the fact that India has not had a single case of polio in two years. We're very close. <laughs> and we need to have the second disease eradicated so we don't talk about the first disease eradicated as if it was some unique thing never to be duplicated. And there's a contest going on in the world between polio eradication and the eradication of guinea worm. I hope it's a photo finish. And we have our second and third diseases eradicated at the same time. But what about the next pandemic? Well, it's a jigsaw puzzle. It's complicated. There are so many different elements in thinking about a pandemic. You've got to have detection. You've got to have verification, point-of-care diagnostics, vaccines if you can get them, antivirals, global collaboration, cooperation, nations talking to each other. We have to find our yellow brick road to get us out of this complicated puzzle. And today I'm going to talk about the progress that's been made in a linear path on the most important elements of putting an end to pandemics. Early detection, verification, real-time reporting, point-of-care diagnostics, rapid response, and governance, global governance. So let's take these one at a time. And let's see if we can bring them down to three messages that I want you to focus on. First, quicker detection leads to smaller epidemics. In the smallpox program, when we first got started in India, it took six months to find the first case in an epidemic. By the end of smallpox eradication, we were finding the first case in six days because of a better surveillance system. Early detection leads to smaller epidemics. Smaller epidemics with better response can prevent epidemics from becoming pandemics, global scourges. But to do that, you've got to take what you learn in one country and extrapolate it all over the world. It doesn't do any good if you've got the best detection system in Florida and the pandemic is all over China, all over Latin America. Whatever you do has got to be globalized. You need good governance. Let's go through each one of these. First, we'll talk about early detection. This is the epidemic curve, the epi curve. The epidemiologists love this. This is our heart. This is what a normal epidemic looks like. Doesn't matter whether it's influenza, HIV, AIDS, SARS, or H7N9. Usually, there's routine reporting. We find it, there's a peak, and the disease ultimately comes to an end. Sometimes you have astute clinicians who find the first case earlier. That shaves the top off of the epidemic, you wind up with a slightly smaller epidemic. Increasingly, there are sentinel nodes, networks that help you find the epidemic earlier. Likewise, you shave a bit off the top of the epidemic. There's a proliferation of digital disease detection systems. I'm going to talk about some of them today. HealthMap and GFIN and ProMed and Google Flu Trends and Flu Near You, all these crazy names. And I'm going to tell you why they're important and what has set them free to proliferate the way that they do. And now there's something brand new. We've been talking about it in other instances. It's listening to patients have participatory surveillance, crowdsourcing of early information about pandemics. And of course, there's the holy grail, because most pandemics, the last 30 novel emerging diseases, have jumped from animals to humans. If you could do surveillance in monkeys and in animals, We'll get to that a little earlier. That would take the epidemic curve two steps to the left. So let's look at what's happening in the world. And this is the really good news. And if there's one slide to remember, this is the one. In 1996, it took almost half a year 
to find the first cases of a pandemic potential disease. 167 days. By 2009, that had dropped to 23 days. From half a year to a little under a month. What made that happen, and how can we make that better over time? Well, there's a lot of things, as I showed you in that puzzle, and they're all important. But the ones that have played an important role are these digital disease detection systems. GFIN, created by the Canadian government, was instrumental in helping us find the first cases of SARS. So did ProMed. GORN, the Global Outbreak Response Network. But probably the most important wasn't even the technological innovations. It was the changes in governance. In 2005, the World Health Assembly approved a change in the way nations work together. The international health regulations were changed. Prior to that, the only way that WHO could respond to a new disease was if a health minister called WHO. After that, in 2007, WHO was mandated to respond to any information, whether it came from an individual, an NGO, the public sector, the private sector, or any of these digital detection systems. It let loose a whole raft of new innovations. And now, if we can continue pushing that so that it takes us less than 25 days, 20 days, 15 days to find the next pandemic, quicker detection equals smaller epidemics. And these are all the players. And there's hundreds more that are coming on board. It's the most exciting thing that's happened in epidemiology in my lifetime since the eradication of smallpox. If you have smaller epidemics with better response, you isolate those epidemics in one place and they don't become pandemics. So when I was at Google, Mark Smolinski and I and three amazing engineers built a system to use all of Google's data and capture every keystroke that was ever entered into Google. That's trillions of pieces of information and do hundreds of multiple logistic regressions to try to find a way to beat CDC's reporting system working with CDC, and we did. We built a system which beat CDC's reporting system by two weeks, and that shouldn't be a surprise because CDC's reporting system requires someone to call a doctor, go visit the doctor, the doctor suspects flu, takes a sample, sends a sample to a lab and brings it back. It's not a surprise that health-seeking behavior is a better way to find a new case of influenza than waiting until you have health confirmation. But wouldn't it be better if we enlisted the cooperation of everybody and got volunteers to report on their health status every single week? And that's what Mark Smolinski and the American Public Health Association and Health Map have built. It's called Flu Near You. It's participatory surveillance. It's a new way of using crowdsourcing to find early detection for influenza. Now, when I say influenza, we just start with influenza. If you can find influenza, you can find SARS. You can find Ebola. You can find so many other non-communicable diseases. But you have to start somewhere. Flu Near You now has 80,000 volunteers who every week are using their cell phone or their computer to answer the simple question, are you healthy or are you sick? And diagnose the disease that they have. And it, in the first year, it was so successful, it became the go-to source of information about influenza. What's even better than that is that today, in Amsterdam, all the different participatory surveillance systems are meeting and they're signing a letter of understanding so that the whole world will have the same system that we can report together on. Same APIs, the same reporting methodologies. So that's really good because smaller epidemics found more quickly lead to ending epidemics becoming pandemics. Perhaps most important, and most boring for most physicians is governance. Because until we get cooperation by governments, we can't stop epidemics, which are inevitable. You're never going to stop the first virus from jumping from an animal to a human. 
You have to act after that. So we need better governance. Last month in, uh, in Thailand at the Mahadol Awards Ceremony, we introduced a new organization called CORGE, Connecting Organizations for Regional Disease Surveillance. It's one of the most exciting things that I've seen. And, and the reason is that there are hot spots where most pandemics begin by history. And if we could put regional collaboration around those hotspots. So the first virus that emerges from Laos or Cambodia or China is detected early, and all the nations around that, which are the first places that the disease would spread to, have an agreement on how they're going to talk about the disease. I mean, what do you do when the first report that you make is in Thai, and you have to tell people who speak Khmer or Chinese or Burmese that there's a patient with a contagious disease coming to their country. A group called INSTEAD has built translation systems. These different organizations, these six major regional disease cooperation organizations, now, now sum up to 28 different countries where the health ministers of those countries in that region cooperate for the very first time, sharing information, working together to end epidemics before they can become pandemics. If you add that to the new digital surveillance systems and the speed with which we are finding diseases, it's a lot to be optimistic about. And, and the organizations that are working together are not just those 28 health ministries and those 28 governments. It includes the World Health Organization, the Organization for Animal Disease, FAO, and it was started by the Rockefeller Foundation and NTI, two foundations who've been working on early detection in healthcare for a very long time. And now the Bill and Melinda Gates is one of the funders, and Skoll Global Threats is one of the funders. And it's housed in France in a different foundation, Foundation Meru. These are all partners in trying to take these novel innovations in early disease detection and make them global so that we can stop pandemics in our lifetime. So let's put all that together. What's the good news? Good news is that we are finding pandemic potential diseases faster than anyone imagined possible. If we can push it just a little bit, we will be able to stop pandemics before they start. Smaller epidemics mean better response, epidemics that don't become global threats. And we're having, for the first time, better governance. And I include the change in the international health regulations, but I'm most optimistic about, for the first time, seeing governments cooperating with each other in a way that we haven't seen. So that's my good news. We have a lot more to do, but the early reports in the field are very optimistic. Thank you very much.